Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you to uh, this new uh, lecture series titled The Life of Prophet Muhammad, where we will delve into the details of his life, we'll examine the biography of the Prophet from the pre Islamic era, from Zaman al Jahiliya to the day of, uh, of his demise. Now, <clears throat> Before we actually uh, begin speaking about the life of the Prophet, there, there are certain introductory uh, remarks that we, meet, uh, that we need to make. The first is, why is it important for us to study the life of the Prophet? What is the significance of the, the seerah? Now, when you look at the life of the Prophet, you see that studying the life of Muhammad ibn Abdullah is, is actually important for Muslims and non-Muslims alike. You know, why is it significant for non-Muslims? I think that it's important to study the life of this man because even if you don't believe that he's a prophet of God, there's no doubt that he is the, the founder of one of the major world religions, uh, which has over 1.5 billion adherence around the world. We're speaking about an individual who is arguably the most influential uh, human being in history. Uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, an American journalist by the name of Michael Hart. He published a book called The 100 a ranking of the most influential persons in history. And <clears throat> he actually places the Prophet Sallallahu at the top of the list. And he offers the following explanation for his decision to rank the Prophet as the most influential person in human history. So Michael Hart, he says, my choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some le some readers and may be questioned by others. You know, I, I, so Michael Hart is obviously a non-Muslim. Uh, many felt that uh, he should have placed uh, Jesus Christ at the top of the list, but he says he argues here that he was that Muhammad was the only man in history who was supremely successful both on the religious and secular levels. And he continues saying, of humble origins, Muhammad founded and promulgated one of the world's great religions and became an, inf an, an immensely effective political leader. So he was influential in the past. And today, he says, today, 13 centuries after his death, his influence is still powerful and pervasive. The majority of the persons in this book had the advantage of being born and raised in centers of civilization, highly cultured or politically pivotal nation, nations. Muhammad, however, was born in the year 570 of the Common Era in the city of Mecca in Southern Arabia, at that time, a backward area of the world, far from the centers of trade, art, and learning. So Michael Hart argues that, you know, what makes Muhammad ibn Abdullah such a fascinating personality is that this is someone who essentially changed the course of human history. And this is an individual who emerged from a largely illiterate culture and he was able to establish one of the major world religions and he continues to have a huge impact on the lives of over 1.5 billion Muslims around the world at least. I mean the prophet of Islam has an impact on, on Muslims and non-Muslims alike. So you see that even from a secular perspective, in order to really understand 
the Middle East, to understand the Muslim dominant regions, to understand you know, human history, uh, it's important to, to shed some light and be familiar with, uh, with this personality. Additionally, we also have, we have many statements from, from non-Muslims about the, the significance of the Prophet in, uh, in human history. We find, for example, that Mahatma Gandhi, he said of the Prophet, I became more than ever convinced that it was not the sword that won a place for Islam in those days in the scheme of life. It was the rigid simplicity, the utter effacement of the Prophet, the scrupulous regard for pledges, his intense devotion to his friends and followers, his intrepidity, his fearlessness, his absolute trust in God and in his own mission. These and not the sword carried everything before them and surmounted every obstacle. So here you see that Mahatma Gandhi acknowledges that the Prophet's success is, is largely because of his message and his teachings and his, his spiritual uh, instructions, the, the, his magnanimous character that allowed him to, to spread his message. And it was not uh, the use of military force. Now, of course, after the death of the Prophet, the Islamic empire expanded because of military campaigns. But what allowed Islam as a religion, as an ideology to flourish and to spread far and wide was the, the magnetic personality of the Prophet himself. And you see, and finally, just uh, one last uh, statement about the Prophet from, from, non, from a non-Muslim perspective is, uh, is Edward Gibbon, the famous British historian who wrote that the greatest success of Muhammad's life was affected by sheer moral force without the stroke of a sword. So you see that it's important even for non-Muslims to be familiar with the life of the Prophet because he's revered by more than a, a billion and a half people around the world. He continues to have an impact on, on geopolitics, on, on religious understanding, on intrafaith dialogue. And there's a lot that can be learned from a man that was able to achieve religious and secular success without the use of, uh, of violence. If you look at the Prophet's life, as we will, inshallah, you'll see that the Prophet tried to always avoid uh, violence. In fact, the, the battles that he fought were defensive battles. The Prophet had no interest in, uh, in shedding blood. He was, he was compelled to defend himself. So that's you know, uh, some of the things that uh, some prominent non-Muslims have said about the Prophet. Now, why is it significant for Muslims to study the life of the Prophet? Now, for Muslims, studying the seerah, studying the, the biography of the Prophet, is actually one of the most essential prerequisites to understanding the Qur'an. Because the Prophet ﷺ is the primary addressee of the Qur'an. Without an understanding of the life of the Prophet, many of the Qur'anic verses uh, are without context. So the life of the Prophet ﷺ is the backdrop of the Qur'an. So for Muslims, studying the seerah is a prerequisite to understanding the Qur'an in depth. It's also important for us because to study the life of the Prophet is to study the life of the most beloved servant of God. And because the purpose of our existence is to attain or at least to strive for human perfection, 
in uh, with in terms of of morality and spiritual development, the Prophet sallallahu is the ultimate model for uh, for Muslims. When you look at the Quran, you see that there are there are over fifty verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa taala commands Muslims to follow the example of the Prophet. For instance, when you look at Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah 33, verse 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرُ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Indeed, in the Messenger of God, you have a good example to follow for him who hopes in God and the last day and remembers God much. So Allah is telling us that the Prophet is the perfect example for you to follow. So the, the implicit instruction here is that you should strive to emulate the Prophet. Now, the only way that you can follow the Prophet, the only way that you can emulate the Prophet is if you're familiar with his life. It's impossible to follow the teachings of the Prophet if you're not familiar with the man himself. So in order to emulate the Prophet, in order to follow him, we have to gain an understanding of who he was. What type of person he was, how he interacted with, with his family members, with friends, with enemies. So really looking at Muhammad ibn Abdullah as a child, as an orphan, as a businessman, as a, as a father, as a husband, as a ruler, as someone who is exiled. You know, how did he deal with adversity? How did he deal with success you know how was he as a ruler how was he as a conqueror so in order for us to follow the prophetic example logic dictates that we have to be familiar with his life in another verse you know the, the quran often speaks about the importance of being grateful to god for the blessings that he has bestowed upon us and the quran actually mentions that the Prophet is actually one of the greatest blessings of God upon humanity, especially the believers. In Surah Ali Imran, Surah 3, verse 164, Allah says, إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Indeed, God conferred a great favor upon the believers. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ The word minna is similar to the word ni'ma. You know, if you, ni'ma means blessing. Minna is, you know, الراغب الإصفهاني, the famous uh, linguist, he says, minna is a ni'matu thaqila. It's a very weighty blessing that the giver, it's such a weighty and valuable blessing that the giver reminds the recipient of its value so it's not taken for granted. So Allah tells us that in the Prophet that God has shown, he has conferred a great favor upon the believers. So if we want to express our gratitude to Allah for sending the Prophet, for blessing us with his guidance and his example, at the very least, one way that we express our gratitude to Allah for guiding us through the Prophet is that we should dedicate some time to studying his life in depth. You know, some of us, we know more about Hollywood celebrities then we know about our own prophet. So studying the seerah of the prophet, number one, allows us to gain information about his life so we can follow him because he's 
as Allah says, he's uswatun hasana. He's the best example for those who wish, who seek God, who want to attain nearness to God. And he is the best example for those who are desirous of the rewards of the hereafter. He's the best example for those who hope in God and who hope in the rewards of the hereafter. So knowing the seerah is a prerequisite to following the Prophet. And then secondly, studying the seerah of the Prophet is a way in which we express gratitude to Allah for the blessing of guidance in the form of the Prophet. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, among all of the, the messengers and the prophets that were sent, we know that according to traditions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent 124,000 prophets to humanity at different times, to different places. And of course, the greatest of them is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. In fact, all prophets of the past knew about the prophet of akhirul zaman the prophet of the end of times in fact not only is it encouraged for us to study the life of the prophet you know one indication of the greatness of the prophet is that people were speaking about his life even before he was born for instance we see in the quran in surah uh, As-Saf, Surah 61, Ayah number 6, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, Jesus articulates the two main tasks of his mission. He says, وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمْ And mention when Jesus, son of Mary, said, يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ O children of Israel, indeed I am the messenger of God to you. So then Isa السلام, he highlights his two main tasks as a prophet who was sent to the Israelites. His first major role is to do what? That he is to confirm what came before me of the Torah. He confirms uh, the, the message of Musa. He addresses innovations that had been introduced. So he confirms what is actually a part of the Sharia ah of Musa. He addresses things that were introduced as innovations into the, uh, the sacred Mosaic law. And then he says, وَمُبَشِّرًا the second, My second role is to do what? وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ and bringing good tidings of a messenger to come after me whose name is Ahmed. So a part of the mission of Isa ibn Maryam is to speak about certain aspects of the life of Prophet Muhammad So you see that the seerah of the Prophet, the seerah is so significant that it is studied by those who came after the Prophet, and even before the birth of the Prophet, many messengers and prophets spoke about the characteristics of the Prophet, the, the Prophet of Akhirul Zaman, the Prophet who would emerge at the end of uh, times. Additionally, you see that many of the prophets hoped that Allah would bless them by making the final messenger to be from their progeny. And of course, this honor was conferred upon Ibrahim and Ismail. Allah gave them the honor of being the patriarchs, the, the honorable ancestors of Rasulullah. In fact, there's a, a hadith, there's a tradition that's mentioned by Ibn Sa'ad in his tabaqat, where he says, he quotes the Prophet, where Rasulullah says, Ana da'wa to Ibrahim. He says, I am the fulfillment of the prayer of Ibrahim, of the dua of Ibrahim. When did what dua is the Prophet referring to? 
قال وهو يرفع القواعد من البيت when Ibrahim was raising the foundations of the Kaaba it's mentioned in the Quran his dua in Surah Al-Baqarah when he finished the construction of Kaaba him and Ismail they made a dua Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasoolan minhum Oh Allah raise from them an apostle who should recite to them your signs and teach them the book and wisdom and purify them. So you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the dua of Ibrahim and Ismail and he places uh, the final messenger of God among their progeny. So the Prophet is a direct descendant of Ibrahim and Ismail. So you see that Many prophets prayed and had supplicated to Allah to make the final messenger of God come from their, from their loins. Now, the seerah is one of the most important disciplines in the Islamic tradition. There are many disciplines that one studies when you want to gain a proficient knowledge of Islam. You know, we have, you know, ilm al-hadith, we have ilm al-fiqh, we have ilm usul al-fiqh, we have there are many different branches of Islamic knowledge. And one of the branches of Islamic knowledge is the seerah, a seerah nabawiya, which is essentially history. Now, what is the meaning of the term seerah? You know, usually when you say seerah, people assume that you're referring to the, the biography of the Prophet. Now, what is the meaning of the term seerah? The word sira comes from the Arabic word sayr, and sayr literally means to travel. For instance, we see in Surah Al An'am, verse 11, Allah says, Qul siru fil ardi, thumma nduru kayfa kana aqibatul mukadibin. Say, travel through the land, siru. Then observe how was the end of the deniers. Now, the reason why the word seerah is used to refer to the biography of the Prophet is that, and it's not the word seerah doesn't just mean the biography of the Prophet, but the Arabs, you know, they used to use this word to refer to a person's biography because when you study the life of a person, when you study a person's biography, you're essentially traveling in their shoes. So because of this, the Arabs employed the word sira, which comes from the word sayr, to refer to a person's biography or their life story. And because the life of the Prophet is, is of such great importance, when you say sira, the assumption is that you are referring so the most important biography, which is the biography of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, when we want to examine the, the life of the Prophet, it's important to familiarize ourselves with some of the earliest sources, the early primary sources on the prophetic biography. So when you look at the opinions of Muslim historians, you see that the traditional view among the Mu'arrikhin, among the historians and scholars, is that the first person who actually wrote the biography of the Prophet, or certain parts of the prophetic biography, was a man by the name of Urwa ibn Zubayr who died in the 92nd year after the Hijrah. And of course, that, that date is an estimation. Now, who is Urwa ibn Zubayr? So Urwa, so, so obviously you notice the date here. So this is essentially, this is over 80 years after the, uh, the death of the Prophet. And Urwa ibn Zubayr is one of the tabi'in, he's one of the second generation Muslims, and he's the son of Az-Zubayr, Az-Zubayr ibn al-Awam, who uh, was a famous companion of the Prophet. And we know that, you know, uh, he, at, at the end of his life, unfortunately, he, end up, he ended up fighting uh, 
Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battle of, uh, of Jama. So his son, Urwa ibn Zubayr, he was a, a very prominent figure in Medina. And historians mention that and, and, by, and by the way, he's the nephew of, uh, of Aisha. So Aisha is his aunt. So he was a very prominent figure in, uh, in, uh, in, in Medina. And because he's the, the son of one of the most famous companions of the Prophet, uh, historians mention that he was the first to record events relating to the life of the Prophet in his written correspondences with the Umayyad Khalifas. So for example, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, who was the Khalifa, the, uh, the Umayyad uh, Caliph, he used to, whenever he had a question about certain aspects of Islamic history or the biography of the Prophet, he would, he would, seek, uh, he would seek out uh, Urwa ibn Zubayr. So a common view is that the first person to write the biography of the Prophet, to write uh, Islamic history relating to the life of the Prophet was Urwa uh, ibn Zubayr. Now, other scholars, and of course, we don't, have, we don't have a consensus on who the first person was to write the, the biography of, uh, of the Prophet. There are different names that are mentioned. Other scholars like Ibn Sa'ad, who is a famous Sunni scholar in his book, uh, Babaqat, he states that Aban ibn Uthman, Aban ibn Uthman, who is the son of Uthman ibn Affan, the third Khalifa, he died in 105 after the Hijrah, and he focused a lot on the Maghazi, the military campaigns of the Prophet. Of course, you know, when you look at the life of any person, you know, people tend to focus on the highlights, the most important events. And of course, uh, in Arabia, uh, you know, some of the most uh, uh, notable events relate to combat and war. So he specialized in the military campaigns of the Prophet, and he actually wrote a small booklet on the subject, and his reports were relied upon by the likes of Malik ibn Anas in his uh, Muwatta, Al-Tabari also takes from him, and so on. Now what's interesting is that, so you see that the, the, the dominant view, especially among Sunni ulama, is that, you know, Urwa ibn, ibn Zubayr is at least, we can say, one of the early authors, one of the early writers of the Seerah of the Prophet. Now interestingly, uh, Agha Buzurg al-Tahrani, who is a Shi'i scholar, he passed away fairly recently. He passed away in 1970. He wrote a comprehensive bibliography on the intellectual heritage and contributions of the Shi'as throughout history, beginning with the, the time of the Prophet until contemporary history. And he mentions in his book, and his book is known as Al-Dhari'a ila Tasanif al-Shi'a, in volume 17, page 153, and he meticulously gathered and he recorded all of the books and the treatises that were written by Shi'as throughout history. Agha Buzurg al-Tahrani contends that the first person to record the events and the military expeditions of the Prophet, the first person to actually write the seerah of the Prophet was a man by the name of Ubaidillah ibn Abi Rafi. Ubaidillah, the son of Abu Rafi. Abu Rafi was actually a servant of the Prophet. He was a khadim of Rasulullah. And this man had such a powerful memory that Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet, used to ask Abu Rafi, Ma, Mada fa'ala Rasulullah fi yom kadha wa kadha? What did the Prophet do on such and such day? You know, it's one thing to remember what the Prophet did in a year or in a month, in such and such month. But to know the Prophet's life so well that you can, you can mention and you remember what the Prophet did on specific dates. So this was Abu Rafi. And of course, this information was preserved by his son, Ubaidullah ibn Abi Rafi. Now, his son, Ubaidullah ibn Abi Rafi, he recorded 
certain aspects of the seerah of the Prophet during the Khilafah of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. So you're talking about between 36 after Hijrah and 40 after Hijrah. So this is, you know, about 50 years before the works of Urwa ibn Zubayr. So Aghabu Zurg al-Tahrani actually says that the first one to write the seerah of the Prophet was Ubaidullah ibn Abi Rafi', but of course uh, his, uh, his book and his writings were destroyed and they did not survive. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any seerah sources from the first century. So none of the, the, uh, the writings on the prophetic biography survived from the first century. So we don't, we, we don't have any of these, uh, these works uh, available uh, to us. Now, the most important biography of the Prophet ﷺ was written in the second century. And it's known as the Seerah of Ibn Ishaq. So there are certain names that you need to be familiar, familiar with because they're essentially, they're, they're really the, the most important primary sources on the, the, the biography of the Prophet. So the Seerah of Ibn Ishaq. Now, who is Ibn Ishaq? His full name is Muhammad Ibn Ishaq. He was born in Medina. He was born in the 85th year after the Hijrah, and he died in the 150th year after the Hijrah. So if you look at that time period, that places him as a contemporary of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. So Muhammad ibn Ishaq, the author of uh, this, the, the famous, most famous biography of the Prophet, was a contemporary of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. And, and I mentioned this for a reason, inshallah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that shortly. So he was born in Medina. And of course, you know, he never met the Prophet. He's a second generation Muslim. He's one of the Tabi'een. Now, what makes the, the biography of Ibn Ishaq unique is that he gathered his biographical information primarily from the descendants of the Sahaba and the residents of Medina. So he lives in Medina, born in 85 after Hijrah. So he grows up in Medina. He lives in Medina. He met some of the grandchildren of the companions of the Prophet. And he would go to individuals who descended from the Sahaba, either uh, sons or grandsons, children of the companions. And he would, he would collect biographical information about uh, the Prophet. What makes his seerah unique is that, number one, he collects his data from the descendants of those who actually lived with the Prophet, companions of the Prophet. He organized the biographical data in chronological order. Now you have to keep in mind that Constructing the seerah of the Prophet in this way is very challenging. He, he essentially went and he interviewed the, the, the children and the grandchildren of Sahaba and as well as some of the, uh, the Jews who lived in uh, Medina. So that's number one. So he conducted interviews with people in Medina who were descendants of the companions. Secondly, he actually wrote the biography of the Prophet in the way that scholars write books on hadith, meaning that he actually mentions the chains of transmission. So when you read, for example, a book of hadith, you have the Senate, the Isnad, an fulan, an fulan, an fulan, and then the, the account is mentioned. So he actually cites the chains of transmission. He tells you who he's getting this information from. So the seerah of Ibn Ishaq at this point in the history of Islam is the most comprehensive biography written about the Prophet until that period. It's actually 15 volumes. So the seerah of Ibn Ishaq in its original form was 15 volumes. So it's, it's a very large 
a book by any measure. And the seerah of Ibn Ishaq is actually divided into three main sections. You have uh, Al-Mabda, the Mabda, which speaks about uh, the beginning of creation, the, the, the stories of past prophets. He mentions all of the prophets from Adam until the Holy Prophet. So the, the, he looks at the history of the history before the prophet, looking at the, the ancient prophets. The second section of his book is the Mab'ath, the, the advent of the prophetic mission, the beginning of the, the prophet's life. And he speaks about you know, the Meccan period. And then the third section looks at events that transpired after the Hijrah. So, you know, Mabda, uh, Mab'ath and Madani period is how you can uh, roughly uh, divide the seerah of Ibn Ishaq. Now, when you look at the seerah of Ibn Ishaq, there are certain points that, that warrant consideration. You know, when you read history, you always, you, you have to know how to study History And one of the most important aspects of studying history is that you have to be familiar with the, the person who is conveying this history. You have to look at the circumstances, the, you know, the world that this person is living in, events that are surrounding this person, because all of these factors actually shape the way that people write. So one thing that, you know, a couple of things that, that are definitely noteworthy is that he wrote his book during the beginning of the Abbasid dynasty. And, and as you'll see, the ruling governments have a tendency, they almost always control information. Governments control populations by controlling information, by controlling media. And one of the most important forms of media in this juncture, in the, in the early history of Islam, is the seerah of the Prophet. So it's important that when we read history, we always have to ask, whose history is this? Is it the history of the ruler or the ruled? The conqueror of the, or the conquered? You know, that's why, you know, for example, Howard Zinn wrote, his famous uh, account of American history, and he titled it The People's History of the United States. Because governments, people in power, will always censor and make omissions to, to assert control and to dominate uh, the narrative. So that's something to keep in mind that this, the seerah of Ibn Ishaq was written during the, the beginning of the, the Abbasid dynasty. And I, what I think is actually more significant is that Muhammad Ibn Ishaq was a contemporary of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. But he does not use Imam al-Sadiq as a source for the biography of the Prophet. And that should raise a very important red flag. Because why would you not interview and speak and spend most of your time with someone who is a direct grandson of the Prophet So the fact that he did not use Imam al-Sadiq as a source for the seerah is definitely something to keep in mind when, uh, when, we, when we think about the authenticity and the reliability of the uh, the seerah of Ibn Ishaq. Now, unfortunately, uh, the biography, the original work of uh, of, uh, of Ibn Ishaq, did not survive, or it's not known to have survived. So we don't have the the seerah of Ibn Ishaq in the third century. So basically, you're looking at about. 67, about 70 years after, 60, 70 years after Ibn Ishaq. So Ibn Ishaq had a student by the name of Al-Bakai, and Al-Bakai had a student by the name of Abdul Malik Ibn Hisham. In the third century, Ibn Hisham, who is another famous 
a Muslim historian, he summarized the work of Ibn Ishaq. So Ibn Hisham received the work of Ibn Ishaq from Baka'i, who is the student of Ibn Ishaq, and he summarized it. So he gives us an abridged version of the seerah of Ibn Ishaq. Now, so he basically condenses that 15 volume work into about four volumes. In the introduction, in the preface, Ibn Hisham, he mentions what he, what, what he used, how he abridged the seerah of, of Ibn Ishaq. So number one, you see that he removed the, the history of previous prophets. And he focused only on the life of the prophet. Whereas Ibn Ishaq dedicated uh, a number of uh, volumes to speaking about past prophets. So here he says, what ta, he, he explains what he omits when he writes the biography of the Prophet. He says, I have omitted some things that Ibn Ishaq mentioned in his work. He says, I removed and I omitted those parts of the seerah of Ibn Ishaq that did not relate to the Prophet. So he removes all of the discussions about previous prophets. And then he continues and he mentions uh, He says, I also omitted you know, a number of poems that were mentioned by Ibn Ishaq because I found that many of the experts in poetry were not familiar with those poems, that they had never heard them. And I removed things that I felt were disgusting or were uh, offensive. He says that I omitted. This is the in, in the introduction. This is important. He says I omitted certain things that would offend certain people. So you see that Ibn Hisham very clearly in, in his preface indicates that there is a certain degree of censorship in my seerah. Now, I want you to keep, and I, so I mentioned that Ibn, Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, they wrote the biography of the Prophet during the reign of the Abbasids. Why is that significant? I know I'm not just giving you trivial information. It's significant for the following reason. One example of an omission that accommodates Abbasid uh, sentiments and uh, uh, that, that, that accommodates the Abbasids is the fact that Ibn Hisham, when he writes the biography of the Prophet, he doesn't mention that Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, was one of the prisoners of war in the Battle of Badr. In the Battle of Badr, Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, was with the Mushrikeen. He fought his nephew. He was captured as a captive in the Battle of Badr. Ibn Hisham doesn't mention his name among the list of captives. Why do you think that is? Because it would be offensive to the Khalifa? Because this is the great-grandfather of the Khalifa. So here, you see an example of a historian censoring and omitting historical facts to avoid insulting the caliph. Another example of censorship in the seerah of Ibn Hisham is that when you look at the third year after the Ba'tha, Allah reveals, and warn your nearest of kin. The Prophet was propagating Islam secretly. Now he is given the command to publicly invite people to Islam, beginning with his family. Ibn Hisham does not mention Hadith al-Dar, the tradition of the house, where the Prophet inv invites the, uh, his family members, his relatives, the sons of Abdul Muttalib, to believe in him and to support him. And this is the tradition where the 13-year-old Ali ibn Abi Talib supports the Prophet and the Prophet says that you are my brother, my successor, and my vicegerent. 
This is not mentioned. Why? It's obvious because the 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 Khulafa are from Bani Abbas. If if he mentions this hadith, people are going to wonder that this hadith indicates that Ali from that from the beginning the Prophet announces that Ali is my successor. So why isn't it why is it not that Ali and the sons of Ali are in power? Why is it that the Abbasids are ruling? So here are just two examples of certain omissions in the seerah of Ibn Hisham. Now, what makes it challenging to reconstruct the biography of the Prophet is, is a number of, there are a number of things that make this a very challenging task. Number one, if you're wondering why it took so long for people to write down and record the life of the Prophet, one of the reasons is that after the death of the Prophet, وآله, the Khulafa, Abu Bakr, Umar, and others, they imposed a ban on written hadith. This is very well known in history. Man al hadith, the prohibition of writing and recording a hadith. So, people were not allowed to write a hadith. So, for nearly a century, there were no written record. There was no written record of hadith except for those who kept personal records. And of course. Ahadith are very valuable sources for the seerah. You know, ahadith are essentially snapshots of the Prophet's life. So because of this ban, there was nothing that was written. People like Ibn Ishaq and others, you know, even Urwa ibn Zubayr, you know, Musa ibn Uqba, all of these individuals who are known as the early, the early primary sources of the seerah, due to this ban. Those who wished to write the biography of the Prophet had to rely on the oral transmission of second generation Muslims. So this, this, is, this complicates the construction, the reconstruction of the seerah of the Prophet. Furthermore, those who came to power after the Prophet, especially the Umayyads, they had they harbored deep resentment towards the prophet in fact if you look just if you just look at the comments of yazid when the head of imam al-husayn alayhi salam arrived in sham he looked at the the severed head of imam al-husayn from his balcony and he said la'ibat hashim bil mulk fala khabar ja wa la wahy nazal that the hashimites which is the family of the prophet they they played around with this kingdom and he says that there is no revelation, there is no, there is no wahi. And he basically says that this is revenge for what you did to our forefathers in bed. So you see that 50 years after the death of the Prophet, Yazid, who is a member of the Umayyads, who is the son of Muawiyah, is expressing his contempt for the Prophet and his family. Because the Prophet upended the power structures in Arabia, you know, the Umayyads were the elites. They were very powerful in the pre-Islamic era. And this is why you see the likes of Abu Sufyan, they fight the Prophet tooth and nail until uh, the very end of the Prophet's uh, life. So those who came to power, especially the Umayyads, they had a grudge against the Prophet. They were jealous of the Prophet. And they had a vested interest in defaming the man who stripped them of their power. They had a vested interest in retaliating against the man who killed their forefathers. So that's something that is important for us to keep in mind. And many of the Umayyads were drunkards. They were fornicators. They committed every sin you can imagine. So naturally, these individuals are going to try to cast the Prophet in the negative light to justify their own moral failures, to justify their own wrongdoings. You know, they, they might forge or fabricate a hadith that the Prophet, he drank once. And, you know, and what's the big deal if we drink? The Prophet, you know, 
forgets what rak'ah he's in when he prays, so do we. So the only way that they were able to justify their corruption is to belittle and denigrate the Prophet. And this is where you see the, the mass fabrication of uh, prophetic traditions. Uh, for instance, we see that during the, the Khilaf of, of Umar ibn al-Khattab, you have a man by the name of Ka'b al-Ahbar, who was originally a Jewish man who had presumably converted to Islam. He had great knowledge of the Bible and the Old Testament. And he used to spread his own hadith and he would, he would share his own understandings of, of theology and the stories of the Prophet. So during the ban, you know, ironically, Ka'ab al-Ahbar was given free reign to share a hadith while others were prohibited from speaking. And therefore you see that certain individuals who come from a Jewish background, who come from other religious traditions, they are given a platform after the death of the Prophet and their stories and their ideas have a negative impact on the way that the Muslims understand who the Prophet is. Now, now, given all of these challenges, how do we reconstruct an authentic rendition of the Prophet's life? Now, of course, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the details of what actually transpired. But what can we do to, to authenticate the the biography of the Prophet. What are the sources that we can use to reconstruct the seerah of the Prophet? Number one, the Quran is actually one of the most important sources of the seerah. Why? Because the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, represents 23 years of the Prophet's life. In fact, there are many verses in the Quran that refer to the Prophet's childhood and his upbringing. So when we want to reconstruct the seerah of the Prophet, and we want to verify whether a historical report about the Prophet is accurate or inaccurate, we have to first ensure that it conforms to the word of God. Because Allah's description of the Prophet is always going to take precedence over the description a human being offers of the Prophet. So for instance, Allah in Surah 68, verse number 4, what does He say about Rasulullah? And indeed, you, O Muhammad, are upon an exalted standard of character. So this means... When we look at the biography of the Prophet, and let's say that we have a narration, and let's assume that the narration is from reliable people. If a report contradicts, if a, if a description of the Prophet's behavior contradicts the divine description of the Prophet, even if that report has a strong chain, we discard it. Because... We don't only use a senant to verify the authenticity of a report. First and foremost, we have to ensure that this doesn't contradict the Quran. This doesn't contradict God's description of his prophet. So when we, we, when we want to reconstruct the biography of the prophet, we have to always bring these historical reports back to these fundamental verses. Another verse, for example, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we have not sent you but as a mercy to the world. So if there's anything in the Prophet's biography that contradicts the spirit of Rahmah, we know that, that this, is not, uh, this is not a true representation of uh, the Prophet Now I want to give you a couple of examples. I know time is running short, but I want to give a couple of examples of certain ahadith that are mentioned in the books of, of Ahlul Sunnah which we, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, do not accept because they are inconsistent with the Quranic descriptions of the Prophet's exalted character. And I, I have the Arabic here, but just very quickly, uh, this is a tradition from Sahih Muslim, 
and the tradition is from Aisha. She says, God's messenger was lying in the bed in my apartment with his thigh uncovered. So his thigh was exposed. And, and I want you to keep in mind that there are many ahadith in the sihah where the prophet says that the thigh, the fakhid is an aura. It's considered a private area. So Aisha says, God's messenger was lying in the bed in my apartment with his thigh uncovered. His thigh was uncovered. And Abu Bakr sought permission to enter. It was given to him. He was given permission to enter. And he conversed in the same very state. Meaning the Prophet spoke to Abu Bakr with his thigh uncovered. Then Umar sought permission for entering. And was given to him. And he conversed in that very state. Abu Bakr comes. The Prophet, is, his thigh is exposed. He continues to talk to Abu Bakr. Umar, same thing. The Prophet doesn't cover up his, his thighs. When Uthman sought permission to enter, God's messenger sat up and he set his clothes right. Muhammad, who's one of the narrators, said, I do not say that it happened on the same day. So the narrator is saying that I don't, I'm not claiming that this all happened on the same day. But when Uthman entered into the presence of the Prophet and conversed, and as he went out, Aisha said, she said to the Prophet that Abu Bakr entered and you did not stir and did not observe much care in arranging your clothes. Omar did the same and you didn't arrange your clothes. When Uthman entered, you got up and you covered yourself. Why did you do that? The Prophet allegedly says, should I not show modesty to one whom even the angels show modesty? Now, according to the followers of Ahlul Bayt, this is a fabricated tradition, whereby you have Uthman ibn Affan, who is one of the Umayyads, who is being elevated at whose expense? At the expense of the Prophet. The Prophet is being belittled as someone who just lies around with his thighs exposed. And I, and I ask you, brothers and sisters, even an average mu'min is not going to have his thighs exposed in, in the presence of someone who's not your spouse. So this is an example of a tradition that is inconsistent with the pro, with Allah's Description of the Prophet, If something is immodest in the presence of Uthman, why is it okay in the presence of Abu Bakr and Umar? So either the Prophet has full adab or he doesn't. So this is why the followers of Ahlul Bayt, the Shia ulama, they put question marks on these traditions because they belittle the Prophet in an effort to elevate uh, certain uh, companions. Another example, Sahih al-Bukhari, Hudayfa narrates. I'll, I'll just read the English. The Prophet and I walked till we reached the dumps of some people. Dumps, it seems like it was a, an area where there was garbage. He stood, as any of you stands, behind a wall and urinated. La ilaha illallah. Al the Prophet was walking by some rubbish and he stood behind a wall. He stood behind a wall and he urinated standing. Hudayfa says, I went away. I wanted to give the prophet privacy. And he beckoned to me to come. So, so the prophet is, God forbid, he's urinating, standing behind a wall. He tells Hudayfa, come. Hudayfa says, I approached him and I stood near his back till he finished urinating. I ask you, brothers and sisters, is this narration... Is it consistent with The Prophet couldn't, couldn't have gone further away and been in complete privacy while he was relieving himself. He's standing. Hudayfa is standing right next to him while he's, while he's urinating. So this is why in the, in the Shi'i tradition, we don't, with all due respect, we don't accept these traditions because they are inconsistent with the divine description of the Prophet. So when we want to reconstruct the seer of the Prophet, number one, we have to ensure that all reports about the Prophet are consistent with the Qur'an, especially his, uh, the Prophet's uh, magnanimous character and his akhlaq. Number two, the traditions of Ahlul Bayt are a very valuable resource for us. You know, we in the Shia tradition, we have the privilege of being able to refer to infallible sources after the demise of the Prophet. Whereas other schools, they have to rely on the reports of uh, fallible individuals in 
constructing the biography of the Prophet. So traditions about the Prophet serve as snapshots of the Prophet's life. And the most reliable source of information about the Prophet after the Quran is the Ahlul Bayt, because they are the only ones who have been thoroughly purified according to Ayatul Tatheer. Furthermore, who better to know the Prophet than his own family, than those who spent every moment of their lives with the Prophet? Why take the seerah from certain companions who joined the Prophet after Mecca was conquered, who spent very little time with the Prophet? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi alayhi, says, وَقَدْ عَلِمْتُمْ In Nahjul Balagh, uh, Sermon 192, وَقَدْ عَلِمْتُمْ مَوْضِعِ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ بِالْقَرَابَةِ الْقَرِيبَةِ وَالْمَنْزِلَةِ الْخَصِيصَةِ وَضَعَنِي فِي حِجْرِ وَأَنَا وَلِيدٌ يَضُمُّنِي إِلَى صَدْرِ وَيَكْنُفُنِي فِي فِرَاشِ وَيُمِسُّنِي جَسَدَ وَيُشِمُّنِي عَرْفَ وَكَانَ يَمْضَغُ الشَّيْءِ ثُمَّ يُلْقِمُنِي وَمَا وَجَدَ لِي كِذْبَةً فِي قَوْلِ وَلَا خَطْلَةً فِي فِعْلِ أمير المؤمنين he says certainly you knew my position of close kinship and special relationship with the Prophet of God Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen is speaking to the Muslims and he's admonishing them for sidelining him after the death of the Prophet he placed me in his lap and when I was an infant, he used to press me to his chest. Don't doesn't it make sense that you take, you know, information about the Prophet's life from someone who is this close to the Prophet, and lay me beside him in his bed, bring his body close to me, and make me smell his fragrance? He used to chew something and feed me with it. Amir al-Mu'minin was literally fed by the Prophet. If this is how much attention Rasulullah gave to the physical nourishment that he gave to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imagine the spiritual nourish, nourishment that he provided the commander of the, of, of the faithful. And then he says, he found no lie in my speaking, nor wrongdoing in any act. Number three, so sources for reconstructing the seerah. Of course, the early biogra biographical sources that we mentioned, we have Ibn Hisham, which no one is denying that it's an immensely valuable source. However, we have to take what is mentioned in the seerah of Ibn Hisham with a grain of salt. We have to keep in mind that there are certain things that have been omitted to accommodate and to avoid offending certain powerful individuals. We also look at you know, the biographies of, of the companions and we look at all of these, uh, these accounts. And finally, and we'll conclude with this, another very valuable source for the seerah, especially the Prophet's childhood and his youth, youthful years, is the poetry of Abu Talib. And the poetry of Abu Talib gives us very important insights into the Prophet's life before the Ba'tha. Imam Amir al muminin and, and, and if you look at uh, Abu Talib, Abu Talib, for example, was the one who officiated the marriage between the Prophet and Khadija, and he gave a sermon on that day, and inshallah, we'll, we'll, we'll look into all of those uh, those statements. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says regarding the, the poetry of his father, Abu Talib, he says, فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ عَلَى دِينِ اللَّهِ وَفِيهِ عِلْمٌ كَثِيرٌ Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, learn it. Learn the poetry of Abu Talib and teach it to your children. For he, Abu Talib, was upon the religion of God and within it, within his poetry, is abundant knowledge. And inshallah, we will use the poetry of Abu Talib to reconstruct some of the, the earlier years of, uh, of the Prophet's life. And uh, we'll be able to gain some, some very valuable uh, insights into the Prophet's character and, uh, and really uh, examine some aspects of his, his formative uh, years. With that, I think uh, I'll conclude. Uh, this lecture, and inshallah, will continue. Continue. Ali Tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajal fajr. Any questions or comments?
One question about how um, the seer of the prophet was reconstructed um, by the person who added the chain of narrations to the book. Ibn was, yes. Yes. So did he uh, create this tradition of adding a chain of narrations or was he copying what other book authors had already started? I don't know of, of anyone who, who mentioned, uh, you're talking about the, 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 tr the practice of mentioning uh, the chains of transmissions in general or in writing the, uh, the mentioning chains of transmission in writing history? Um, I, I, either. We don't know. I mean, I, I think that, you know, very early on, you know, because of the Prophet Sallallahu explicitly said, you know, that there will, there will be many people who will lie about me. I think that that naturally made people uh, skeptical uh, when it came to hadith. So therefore, when people heard things being ascribed to the Prophet, the first way of authenticating uh, a hadith is to ask what is the chain of transmission. So I don't think that Ibn Ishaq was the first one to establish the practice of, of citing the chain of transmission. But when, when it comes to written uh, history, recorded history, uh, it seems that he's the first one uh, to, uh, to do so in elaborate detail and, and provide the isnad for uh, for all of the historical accounts that he provided. Uh, thank you. And um, from the quote from uh, Mahatma Gandhi, when yes. he talked about his intense devotion to friends and followers, yeah. uh, could you share an example of uh, of that, perhaps? I mean, I, th I think one one example is um, you know the Prophet ﷺ when he saw that uh, his his followers were being persecuted in uh, in Mecca. He sent them to to Abyssinia. You know, he remained in Mecca, and he continued to place himself in danger. And he was more concerned about the safety of his followers. So he sends uh, a group of his followers followers to uh, to Abyssinia under the leadership of of Jafar uh, ibn Abi Talib. If you look at the uh, the years of uh, in uh, the Shab of Abi Talib, when uh, sanctions were placed on the early Muslims, you see that the the Prophet used to go uh, used to go hungry to ensure that his followers were fed. So there are many examples where the Prophet Sallallahu is willing to endure hardship um, and uh, and protect his his own followers uh, from those hardships. So you know the Prophet. You know, and that's what made him so, uh, so lovable and so, uh, so unique, is that people saw that he was a selfless person. Uh, he never behaved like uh, a king or an emperor. He he lived uh, the hardships along with his followers, and if there was ever an opportunity to alleviate the suffering, he would always place others uh, before himself. Thank you. And is there a good source that you would recommend where we could read the poetry of Abu Talib? I would have to do a little bit of research. Not in, in Arabic, it's a bit uh, it's a bit easier, but in English, I assume that the audience uh, would prefer material in, uh, in English. I would have to to check on that. I'll, inshallah, I'll, uh, as we go through the sirah, I'll, I'll provide some of those references, but unfortunately off the top of my head, I can't think of uh, a reference that, that provides uh, a detailed account of, uh, of his poetry. I know that uh, there was a book that was written maybe a couple decades ago, uh, a restatement of the history of Islam and Muslims. It's a very, uh, it's a very thick uh, book on the, uh, the life of the prophet and also uh, uh, early Islamic history after the death of the prophet. In, in it, there are there's a mentioning of some of the uh, the couplets of uh, of Abu Talib, but an independent work that showcases his poetry in English. I'm not aware that anything has been uh, produced. Thank you very much, Sheikh Azhar. Uh, I hope uh, you guys enjoyed this. I hope it wasn't too. Uh,
too in depth, but I'm trying to do a thorough job. So if there are certain parts that you think are a bit, uh, you know, too nerdy, then just bear with me and I'll, I'll inshallah get to the more, uh, you know, interesting material. But I think that, you know, for the sake of uh, being comprehensive, uh, I think it's important to kind of give as much information as possible. Uh, thank you very much. Inshallah, may, may Allah please uh, give, give you long health and life and happiness uh, to you and your family. And you should get more of these, uh, continue, looking forward to the continuation of this series. May Allah bless you and I'll, I'll see you guys. Allah gives us tawfiq. We'll meet again uh, next week.